and welcome to Guide is Everything, a podcast with topics ranging from sex to astrophysics. This is episode two, and uh, today I'm going to take up uh, the subject of role-playing games. What are role-playing games? There are different types of role-playing games, and um, the most uh, probably known is the type of role-playing games where people sit around a table, there is a games master that is directing a story that the other people are playing a part of, uh, and one of the most uh, well-known role-playing games is Dungeons and Dragons, a uh, type of role-playing games that started uh, in the 70s. And if you've seen the movie E.T., um, that's when, uh, in the beginning of the movie, the uh, alien E.T. falls down in the garden and the kids inside are sitting there playing role-playing games. And um, Dungeons and Dragons, or D&D for short, was uh, picking up uh, in popularity uh, very much in the 80s. And this is the backdrop of uh, the series in, on Netflix called Stranger Things, where the kids are heavily into role-playing games, and Stranger Things is from the 80s, uh, when uh, role-playing games were at its peak, I would say. But it never really faded. It's still very active, even though uh, the computer games and role-playing games on computer has been um, taken over in popularity among many kids. But role-playing games as the original tabletop sitting around a table, uh, being social, talking to each other, and uh, playing out the character you have in front of you described on a piece of paper, uh, that, that's a part of um, you know, socializing that the computer games uh, probably never will actually capture, in, in essence. And then there is another type of role-playing games called live role-playing game, where you go out into the woods, you dress up, and uh, you, you put on the armor or, you know, old... If you're doing medieval type of role-playing games live, you would dress up in medieval clothing, and uh, you will do battles, not, not with real swords usually, but with uh, latex swords and uh, some armor and stuff, and, and you would do uh, improvised magic, and there is a sort of a sports uh, theater type of thing. But that's not the one uh, type of role-playing game I'm going to talk about today. It's a tabletop role-playing game, which is my focus on this episode of this podcast. Now, I've been playing role-playing games like that tabletop since uh, 1981. When I first encountered this as a 14-year-old uh, in Oslo, uh, I was mesmerized by the fact that you could play, you can have a character, you can create a character, you can describe it, you can, you can think about how his personality is, and you can really go into this character. Uh, and you're not acting like that uh, around the table, it's more like you're telling the game master what your character is doing, and the others are, are, are as well. Let's say you are four players and one game master. And these four players, they take turn or they, they talk maybe on top of each other sometimes if they become really excited. And they take turns about what are they character going to do with the situation that the, the game master presents them. So let's say the game master is, uh, is presenting a, a situation where they walk down into a dungeon. It's, it's a cavern. And, and nobody knows what's in the cavern except the game master. He's hiding behind his game master screen, and all the secrets behind that game master screen is is captured in pieces of paper and maybe maps and some drawings and stuff. And as uh, the characters walk down this uh, this uh, cavern, the game master says, "Oh, the cavern is dripping, and there is like an echo in there, and you have your torches, and uh, and there is smoke coming uh, from the torches. You can smell only." Uh, the damp air and the blended with the torches uh, smoke, and uh, who is going first? And he looks at the at the players, and the players are looking nervously at each other and say, "Well, well, I'm the warrior type, so I'll I'll, I'll think I'll go first. And uh, the game master says, "Okay, so who's second, third, and and who's uh, in the back?" And nobody wants to be in the back. Uh, nobody wants to be first either. So there were, maybe there is a quarrel of who's going to be two and third. Now. After a while, they, they figure out who, what is the, the line of, uh, of walking here. And the game master say, okay, fine. So what do you do? Well, we walk slowly down the cavern uh, corridor, the warrior type says. And um, uh, game master says, okay, now you see down there, there is sort of the, the cavern uh, corridor is, is uh, expanding into something that you can decipher, maybe see as a room. And they become all excited, and they say, "Okay, so so, so the the archer type he takes his arrow uh, to the bow and uh, and is ready to shoot if something jumps at them." 
And this is how the role-playing game sort of plays out. The game masters tells what the characters see. They, they, they get this description of their environment by the game master. And the game master plays every character that is not played in the world by these four players. So let's say the four players have one character each. They could have more, but in this uh, scenario, they only have one. You have a warrior type, you have an archer type, maybe you have a priest type that can do healing because they will get damaged if they fight monsters, etc. So some type of a healer should be in the party. And then you might have a wizard who can do fire strikes and, and maybe levitate and do some crazy magic, which adds to the spice of the whole story. <clears throat> so... And these four guys, they, they talk about what their character is doing and the game master is playing every monster. He, he lays out the scene, he talks about how uh, the environment looks like, what the smell is, what the taste is, and he plays every single person in the village they come to or every person in the city they encounter. Uh, he has a lot to do. Not only is he creating the whole environment, or creating the, the specific adventures or the towns or the villages or the forest or the fairies or everything like that. He's also playing out the personality of every person the characters meet. So the, the game master must be sort of a multi-talented guy where he can uh, be social, but he can also be creative. He can be uh, intelligent in figuring out what would entice the characters and the players the most. Now, the whole purpose of a game master is to make fun, it's, it's not to be like a joker, but to create the environment and the adventure which is fun to play for the players. And the players, they participate in creating this common story. And it's not so much about competition, it's more about teamwork usually. It's the characters against the environment and the environment is what the game master has created. So <clears throat> it's, it's much like uh, playing out life in a fantasy setting, usually. So if you have uh, seen the movie Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or any of those uh, type of fantasy movies, you would get the scene of Dungeons and Dragons. But there are many other role-playing games. You could have science fiction role-playing games, you could have pirate 1500 uh, role-playing games, modern role-playing games like James Bond, or you could have western role-playing games, cowboy versus Indians. You could have all kinds of various settings for the role-playing games. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> when you get into the gameplay, uh, there are certain rules, uh, and those rules are captured in that specific role-playing game, like Dungeons and Dragons has its own set of rules, Pathfinder has its own set of rules, that's a different, uh, sort of a, a fork or, or a similar role-playing game to Dungeons and Dragons. But then there are vastly different game systems and rules and how you, dis uh, how you decide stuff within the game. Because certain things you, you don't need to decide. Like uh, you walk across the room. Well, you just say you walk across the room. There is no undecisiveness in walking across the room unless something happens along the way. But if you're going to fight a dragon, there is certain things that are undecided. Like, will you hit the dragon or will the dragon hit you with his fiery breath? Now, these kind of things are uncertain situations and there you need a way to decide. Are you hit by the troll's axe? And if he hits, how much damage does he do to what part of your body? And will that part be usable anymore? So if the troll hits you in the leg, will you be able to stand on that leg? Or would you have to kneel? Or, you know, there are certain consequences out of any situations that is decided. Now, how do you decide these things? These are various ways a role-playing system can, uh, can work out how to decide things. But the usual way is to throw a dice. Now, um, in my, uh, in my history as a role-playing gamer, I very f uh, quickly came into being a game master. So in 1982-83, I started my own role-playing game world, and I started with Dungeons and, and Dragons, and then I went over to another uh, game system called RuneQuest, and then I modified RuneQuest, and then I created, together with uh, some other guys, uh, Ben Breikas, uh, Stein Halvorsen, and uh, Dag Asain, uh, I created a system called the Mega Role-Playing System, which was uh, one of the most realistic role-playing systems in the world in 1987. But it was very complex, way, way, way too complex, I think now. So after having published that in the UK and the US, I started on a mission uh, together with Bent 
um, to uh, simplify, 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 make it simpler, the whole game system. And then we came down to, we don't need all these various dices like uh, eight-sided dice or 10-sided dice, 12-sided dice, or the usual 20-sided dice, which is very much used in Dungeons and & Dragons and Pathfinder. We settled on using the normal dice that you see in a casino, uh, so-called D6, uh, six-sided dice. And we would throw one die, and you would add the skill value to overcome a certain difficult rating. So let's say to hit the troll, you would actually have to get a total of 10. Now you have four in your skill value, you add the dice. And if you only have four in the skill value, you actually have to throw a six on the dice to be able to hit the troll. Now he might have a higher skill than you, so he might only have to throw a three in order to hit you. So that's a very unfair combat and you'll probably die. Now the way in a Mar role-playing game, uh, it's uh, the, the, the wiki, the whole role-playing system is free and open source and you can find it on d6gaming.org, d6gaming.org and you will find everything there. You'll find the backdrop, you will find the whole, uh, the kingdom of Amar described, the mythology of Amar described and this is the culmination of more than 30 years of campaigning in my role-playing game world. So, so a lot of stuff is in there and the whole game system is in there. And the game system is simply like this. Every time you're going to do something which the Game Master uh, says is undecided, you will have to throw a dice. And uh, you will add your skill value to match a certain difficult rating. That's the whole system. So the Game Master says, oh, oh, you're going to climb that cliff. Fine, the difficult rating is 9. Then you look at your character sheet and you see that climbing, you have a 6 in climbing, therefore you need to throw a three or more on the dice in order to actually be able to climb that cliff. And the game system takes care of all these uh, difficult ratings. That's what the game system is for. It says climbing a cliff is this hard, if it's slippery it's a little harder, if you have a rope it's a little easier, if you have help from a friend it might be easier yet, etc. So the whole game system is described in terms of what is the difficulty rating for doing various things in the game. And then you have your character with these skill ratings, and that will obviously improve. Just like a friend of mine, Ole Wik, says, um, whatever you practice a lot, you will become good at. So if you practice, if you train, or you do stuff a lot, you will increase in these skill values. They will go up during the game. And that's why this is not just one game night where you play these characters, usually. In my campaign, it goes on and on and on and on. Like now I have this uh, set of um, uh, uh, characters played by 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old boys. Uh, my two sons are with, uh, uh, with them in that group. And we play every second weekend. And this has gone on for maybe three years now. So the characters have improved a lot, they have become uh, fleshed out, their personality is more complete, uh, their interaction between each other has been more interesting. Sometimes there is competition, sometimes there is quarrels over loot or who gets to do this or who gets to you know, pick up the girl in the bar. There are various things happening and not everything has to do with throwing dice. A lot has to do with social interaction between the characters or between the characters and the so-called non-playing characters which are played by the Game Master, everybody else in the world where the Game Master is putting on a voice and saying oh, the, the, the old the troll under the bridge is coming up and talking to you, you know, negotiating for passage over the, over the bridge or something. Or the old uh, innkeeper is, uh, is telling a story and then I ask the Game Master, I try to be that uh, that old innkeeper and tell the story as he would, right? So everything is like going on with uh, interactions and, and social situations, etc. And a lot of that has nothing to do with the dice. It's only when you come down to skills, uh, you have to do something which is based on a certain skill and you have to match a difficulty rating, that is when you do a dice roll. Just like in combat. Combat is very much undecided. So that's why there is a lot of uh, rolling of the dice when it's combat. But when they are into a city, like the, the capital of uh, Amar, the, the kingdom where we play, um, then there is a lot of situations that has nothing to do with game uh, or playing dice but or rolling the dice. It has a lot to do with being the character and talking to the people around you. 
Now, it might be slightly confusing that the game system itself is called Amar, and um, the, the whole setting is played out in the kingdom of Amar, but that's just for, you know, a holistic, you know, I just gave the whole name of Amar to, to this whole thing. Now, uh, Amar as, um, as a term actually comes from a um, uh, game show that Stein Halvorsen and I did on a local radio station show back in the 1987 to 1990s. Uh, that's when we did role-playing games on the air and people would call in and be this character in the world and sometimes this world was Amar. When we did fantasy game uh, play it would be Amar but sometimes we also did James Bond or, or science fiction or whatever. But uh, Amar came, came actually from that game show. We used that as a name for a fictive kingdom. Now it, it was brought to life in this Amar role-playing game that you can find on d6gaming.org. If you want to try playing this, uh, you can just uh, go to d6gaming.org and you can read the introduction, you can uh, listen again to this podcast and get a feel of what this is all about. And then you can uh, try with your friends, uh, be this game master. There is, there is a first adventure there that you can just take. You don't have to create your first adventure. You can just take the first adventure, which is placed on this uh, wiki website. And then you can try being a game master. And it's not about doing it perfectly or being this fantastic game master in the first run. It's about just doing it and trying and failing and failing more. There's a lot of failing going on. And that's that's not a problem. You're among friends. You just fail as a game master, you become better. What you do a lot, you what you practice, you become good at. And when you do this a few hundred, few thousand times, then you'll be really, really good. And the players will think you're a great game master and you will all have a lot of fun. So the whole purpose of this is obviously to have fun, but it's also some side effects, like you will learn about social situations, you will be more interactive, you will learn how to, uh, to think like another person, to be more tolerant of other viewpoints, because you're going to play not only yourself, but a different personality usually in the character that you play. And this, this is something that I guess um, actors uh, would get a lot of benefit from being able to actually go into the mind of another character and be that character for some hours. And um, so that's one uh, situation that is uh, helping the, the players evolve as human beings. And when you do this with kids, uh, they will also learn a lot from reading the role playing games. Uh, so it's a uh, training in reading and it's training uh, for my Norwegian kids is training in le learning English because they have to read the wiki in English. And also some of the players there are so eager to contribute also to the game system and, uh, and the, the gaming world that they change the stuff on the wiki because I give them free access to that. You can go in and you can change the game rules if you like. You can, you can see how this works out. You can put some more spells, magic spells in there or magical items or rituals or more creatures if you like. There is a lot of stuff you can do in the wiki. And if you are one of the gamers uh, that, that uh, get this bug called the Amar role-playing bug, that where you actually have to play role-playing all the time, or you think it's really funny, you have to do it every second week, then you can ask me for permission to be one of the contributors to the wiki. And then you can go in and change or add or, you know, contribute more to this gaming world called Amar, the kingdom of Amar and the surrounding areas or the game system itself. Let's say you want to flesh out the skill of dancing because there's not much said about dancing as a skill in the game system as it is now, but you can add that if you'd like to. Then you would put down some difficult ratings, uh, how easy it is to uh, to dance a waltz or a rumba or some other kind of dance. You can put difficult ratings on these things. And by contributions, by this community creating more stuff, you will have a game system that is evolving and, and fleshed out and, and more interesting for more people to play different kind of situations. So, so there's all kinds of stuff that is happening with role-playing games. And one thing that is uh, helping a lot, it creates enthusiasm, it creates purpose in life, it creates uh, fun, it, it injects life, more life into life, as you can say. It's, this is something I really enjoy doing and I really enjoy seeing other people enjoy it a lot. So this is it for the actual introduction to role-playing games. Now I'm going to do some more podcasts on 
the actual game system and uh, the world of Amar, the kingdom of Amar, and who is who and what is what and where are the dwarves hiding and what are the elves doing and uh, why cannot an elf be an, a vampire and uh, why are uh, trolls immune to magic and all kinds of stuff. I will talk about this later. But this is it for this um, introduction. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, uh, you can come back anytime you want and uh, listen to this and other podcasts on isene.org, I-S-E-N-E.org. This is my uh, homepage, my, uh, my everything. This is where I put out a lot of stuff. And everything you find on isene.org is free for you to take, to use, to do whatever you like with. I just like to give away things for free. Uh, including this podcast and a lot of one-page books there that you can just uh, rip and take and read and distribute and do whatever you want with. So, uh, have a jolly time, do some role-playing, enjoy the, the fun, the creativity that it brings along and have some fun with your friends. Thank you very much. See you sometime later.